Okay. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the Collaborative on Health and the Environment Alaska Teleconference on Chemical Contaminants in Traditional Food from St. Lawrence Island. Findings from a new study, an update on international actions to eliminate persistent pollutants. My name is Diana DeFazio, and on behalf of Alaska Community Action on Toxics, I'll be facilitating today's call. CHE Alaska is a regional partnership group of the National Collaborative on Health and the Environment. CHE Alaska aims to advance knowledge and effective action to address growing concerns about the links between human health and environmental factors. You can find, mo find more information on the website www.healthandenvironment.org and www.akaction.org. This call will last one hour. Except for the speakers, all participants are muted during the presentation. There will be time for questions and discussion towards the end of the call. Before introducing our first speaker, I'd like to give you just a little background on today's topic. Pesticides and industrial chemicals originating from thousands of miles away travel northward via oceanic and atmospheric currents and accumulate in the north because the cold climate and fat-based food web favor their retention. The concentrations of these persistent pollutants increase at higher levels of the food web, which means that Alaska Native peoples and others living in the circumpolar <coughs> north bear disproportionate burden of environmental contaminants. At the request of and in collaboration with the Yupik people of St. Lawrence Island, Alaska Community Action on Toxics, together with universities in Alaska and New York, conducted a study to determine contaminant levels in traditional subsistence foods. Today our presenters will be discussing findings from that study as well as actions that the communities are taking to protect their health. We'll also hear an update on international efforts to eliminate certain persistent pollutants from worldwide use. And though not the focus of today's call, it's worth mentioning that the collaborative research efforts between Alaska Community Action on Toxics, St. Lawrence Island Villages, and universities in Alaska and New York was recently awarded a new five-year federal research grant to conduct research related to two emerging endocrine disrupting chemicals. PBDEs, to the class of flame retardant chemicals, and PFCs, used to make materials stain, oil, and water resistant, like Teflon and Scotchgard, for example, and to assess exposures from surface waters, household dust, and traditional foods. Now it's my pleasure to welcome and introduce our first speaker, Dr. David Carpenter. Dr. Carpenter is director of the Institute for Health and the Environment at State University of New York at Albany School of Public Health. Dr. Carpenter previously served as director of the Wadsworth Laboratory of the New York State Department of Health. He received his doctorate from Harvard Medical School, has hundreds of publications to his credit. He has been working with villages on St. Lawrence Island on community-based environmental health research projects for 10 years. David, would you like to begin? Okay, thank you, Diana. Uh, I should just first make a, a, a proud announcement from me. Our Institute for Health and the Environment has just been designated as the collaborating center of the World Health Organization in, uh, r r in understanding the uh, activities we've had in international settings as well as in the Arctic. Uh, some years ago, we were asked by the uh, residents of St. Lawrence Island and the villages of Savunga and Gamble to uh, take some blood samples from people to see whether they had elevated levels of various contaminants. And that was based on the concern that diseases were appearing in the community that had been uncommon before, particularly cancer. We did take blood samples, and those results were published in the Journal of Circumpolar Health, uh, volume 64, page 322 in 2005, and they did demonstrate that the levels of PCBs and three pesticides that our laboratory monitors were elevated, and that was especially true for the PCBs. So the, the next question really was, what is the source of, of this elevation? And there were two possibilities. Uh, the, the one that turned out to be the major cause is atmospheric transport of uh, PCBs and pesticides from temperate regions. This is called the grasshopper effect. And what it is is that uh, while these chemicals are not terribly volatile, they do go into the air from contaminated sites. And they evaporate with water from uh, rivers, from contaminated sediments up on the shoreline. 
And then the air currents carry those vapor phase uh, PCBs to the cold Arctic, where they where the temperature causes them to precipitate. And then they bioconcentrate in the food supply, uh, and then ultimately into people. In addition, there are two former military sites on St. Lawrence Island, one actually at the village of Gamble, and the other being the Northeast Cape, which was uh, a larger, more contaminated military site that is removed somewhat from either village. Uh, in this 2005 paper, we could demonstrate that everybody had elevated serum PCBs, which implicated atmospheric transport as the major source of exposure. But there was a slightly elevated exposure in those people who had hunting camps near the Northeast Cape. So there was a contribution there as well. All right, so then the next question was, is, uh, what is the source of exposure? Well, uh, while in temperate climates, breathing in these PCBs that are in the air is an important consideration, in the Arctic, it was pretty likely that it came from the food. And so again, at the request of the uh, residents of St. Lawrence Island, uh, between 19, uh, well, let's see, 1997 and 19, uh, 19, uh, sorry, 2007 and 2009, we collected 327 samples of food and for analysis of PCBs and pesticides and 216 samples of food for analysis for metals. And the foods were the variety of foods, the traditional foods that the Yupik people eat. Some were taken directly from fresh killed animals, where we uh, had samples of blubber, samples of meat, samples of organs. Uh, others were taken from food basically off the kitchen table, so prepared foods as they would be eaten in, in Yupik homes. Uh, and we analyzed these foods for PCBs, for three pesticides, DDE, which is a derivative of DDT, hexachlorobenzene, which is a widely used pesticide, and Myrex, also a pesticide. Uh, and those pesticides probably weren't used that much except for DDT on St. Lawrence Island, but again, they migrate up there by air. So all of these chemicals are fat soluble, and therefore one would expect they would be most present in animal fats. Uh, we analyzed uh, the same foods, albeit not quite the same number, for nine different metals, and I'll talk about those in a bit. Uh, now, but let me first talk about the PCBs primarily. The pesticide levels were a little bit elevated relative to people that live in the lower 48, but they were not as elevated and not as of as great a concern as the PCB concentrations in the traditional foods. Now, the question we're always asked is, what level is safe and what level is dangerous? And there is absolutely no simple answer to that question. And let me address that a little bit before I talk about the results. Uh, marine mammals, like fish, uh, have relatively high levels of omega-3 fatty acids. And omega-3 fatty acids are a form of fat that humans cannot make, and we must uh, obtain them. They are essential, but we must obtain them from our diet. And they are uh, made by small microorganisms in aquatic environments. And in the oceans, they bioconcentrate. So they're made by these little algae and, and microorganisms. They get eaten by small fish and then the little fish get eaten by the bigger fish, and it goes so on, goes up through the food supply, uh, gets into the whales, the seals, and the walrus from either eating the krill, or in the case of the whales, or eating fish in the case of the seals and the walrus. Uh, now, those are important for brain function. They are reported to reduce the risk that you'll die after a heart attack. There is no known ability of omega-3s to reduce the risk of cancer. Uh, now, EPA has given advisories on the levels of contaminants in fish that will protect you from cancer and from non-cancer health effects. In this case, the cancer advisories are the more stringent. 
and while you probably will not remember the numbers, what EPA suggests is that you should never eat any fish if the concentration of PCBs is greater than 94 parts per billion. And try to remember that number. But you can eat as much as you want without danger of increasing your risk of cancer if the PCB concentration is less than 1.5 parts per billion. Parts per billion is the unit of measure of PCBs because PCBs are really a mixture of a variety of different chemicals that have somewhat different molecular weights. So that's how PCBs are uh, normally reported is in terms of parts per billion or parts per million. Now, what we did was, uh, we, let me first talk about the results we found in the blubber and the uh, adipose tissue. So this is uh, fat taken from the animals at the time of harvest. Uh, in bearded seal, the average concentration from 21 different seal samples was 116 parts per billion. So clearly that exceeds that EPA guideline for don't ever eat any of it. For ring seal, the average of two was 73, which would trigger an advisory for don't eat it very often. Uh, for bowhead whale, the value was 317, uh, very, very high. For uh, bowhog, bowhead muntock, which is blubber and skin, the value was 143. Walrus rubber was the least contaminated, and that had a value of 34. Polar bear blubber, since polar bears eat on seals, had the highest value we found of any of the fat tissues, a value of 445. Reindeer had very, very low values. Uh, the, the level in adipose tissue was 2.3. So. Uh, what you see there is pretty much what you suspect. The marine animals have high concentrations of these carcinogens in their fat, but the reindeer, because they are land animals and they're eating primarily plants and moss, which are not contaminated, they have quite low levels. We then looked at the rendered oils, and these are the oils that people use for cooking. And as you would expect, the values in the rendered oils reflect those uh, in the blubber. So uh, four samples of bearded seal rendered oil had a value of 241 parts per billion, spotted seal 251, bowhead whale rendered oil 354, walrus oil uh, less than the others 193, but still way above the value that EPA would consider to be safe. Now let's go to meat. Uh, the, the levels of PCBs in meat, and this was true for the pesticides as well, were very, very much lower than those in the blubber or the rendered oils. And that is consistent with the fact that the PCBs dissolve in fat. So if you have a pure meat source, you would not expect to have uh, effectively any PCBs or pesticides in them. Uh, so bearded seal meat, uh, an average of 23 samples, the lo level was 2.6 parts per billion. Uh, ring seal, 5.06. But notice even though these are much lower, they're still high enough to trigger some advisories. Uh, bowhead meat, the value was 27 parts per billion. Walrus, the value was 14. Uh, that was breast meat. The walrus meat was the lowest. This is of 28 samples, a value of 1.7. Polar bear, 13.2. Uh, so polar bear, because they eat primarily seals, had the highest values. We did look in a few fish, and uh, the fish tended to be uh, relatively low. Now, uh, this certainly suggests that one could have a much lower exposure to these contaminants if you uh, ate more meat and ate less fat. Uh, so the, the, in fact, the, uh, the blubber and the rendered oil uh, consider, con constituted much more than three quarters of the exposure. And uh, the marine mammals are much more contaminated than are the reindeer. Now, uh, let me talk about the metals. Uh, we looked, I 
think I misspoke earlier. We looked at seven metals, mercury, copper, zinc, arsenic, selenium, cadmium, and lead. And we really found levels that were relatively low for all of these. Now, uh, in fish, the big issue is mercury because in, when mercury is emitted into the environment and it comes from anything from volcanoes to, to power plants, especially if they burn coal, uh, in the aquatic environment, microorganisms convert the inorganic mercury to organic mercury. And or, organic mercury, uh, like PCBs, can uh, cause effects on the brain and behavior. But unlike PCBs, the, uh, the organic mercury is found in the meat, not in the fat. It's not that fat soluble. Uh, we did find that there was some mercury and arsenic in the fats and hardly any in the meat. That suggests that the mercury and the arsenic were both the organoforms that are relatively fat soluble, even though they bind to the muscle as well. Uh, but the, the concentrations were not high enough to trigger uh, any significant advisories. The levels of mercury, cadmium, copper, and zinc were elevated in a few of the organ samples, but they were not uh, uh, highly elevated in either the fats or the meats. And uh, the organ that these tend to concentrate in is the kidney. Uh, and uh, the the toxicity from excessive uh, intake of those metals tend to be kidney toxicity. So uh, in summary, uh, the concentrations of PCBs and the chlorinated pesticides were high in the fats of the marine mammals that are used for food in St. Lawrence Island. Uh, now the, uh, the concern is, of course, but, and I should say that we did not measure the omega-3 fatty acids. We we're certainly aware of it and actually wrote a big grant to study the omega-3 fatty acids, which unfortunately was not funded. Uh, because the real issue here is do the omega-3 fatty acids, which are clearly beneficial, at least against some diseases, do they counterbalance the hazards of the chemical, the organic chemical contaminants? Uh, they almost certainly do counterbalance some of the hazards. PCBs, for example, are known to have adverse effects on learning and memory, especially if you're exposed as a child. Omega-3 fatty acids are known to have positive effects on learning and memory, especially if you're exposed as a child. Uh, the omega-3 fatty acids, as I mentioned a bit earlier, are also known to reduce the risk that you will die after you have a heart attack. And we know that this is a consequence of the fact that these omega-3 fatty acids uh, dissolve in the membranes of heart muscle, and they reduce the chance that the heart muscle will go into fibrillation, which is the reason that most people will, if they die after a heart attack, it's because their heart goes into fibrillation. So they may not prevent the heart attack, but they can reduce the chances that you'll die after having it. The problem, as I mentioned earlier, is that uh, omega-3 fatty acids are not known to prevent cancer. And the, uh, the chemicals that we, we studied, uh, PCBs, DDE, uh, hexachlorobenzene, and myrix, are all rated as probable human carcinogens. They're only probable carcinogens because None of us are ever exposed to one alone. So when we get cancer, we can't say it was due to the PCBs and not to the DDE and the Myrex and the hexachlorobenzene. But uh, these are all carcinogens in animals, and there is real concern that they are also carcinogens in people, and every reason to believe that they are. <laughs> uh, now, you know, I think it's totally inappropriate for any external person to tell anybody what to eat and what not to eat. What is appropriate and what we feel strongly about, especially when we're asked by the community to provide information, is that we provide information to the residents of St. Lawrence Island about which foods have more of these contaminants and which foods have less. Uh, there, it's not such a simple thing as to say, well, you know, reduce your consumption of fats and eat more meat, 
all that although that would certainly uh, reduce the intake of the contaminants but one has to balance the cultural uh, traditions of the community uh, the the value of traditional foods that are sometimes independent of the immediate concerns about whether something would cause disease or not. So we have uh, presented these results uh, on several occasions to the community, and the results have just been published in a peer-reviewed peer journal. It's the Journal of Toxicology and Environmental Health, Part A, Volume 74, page 1195, uh, this year, 2011. And we are grateful to the people on St. Lawrence Island who, uh, number one, collected all of the foods for our analysis and have become real friends of uh, our whole research group over the years. So I think I'll stop there and uh, let everyone else talk and then take questions. Thank you, David. Thank you so much. And congratulations on the Institute of Health and the Environment being selected as a World Health Organization partner. Thank you. That's great news. Um, next, I'd li and just to remind everyone, there'll be an opportunity at the end of the call um, for some questions. So hold on to your questions if you have questions for David. Next, I'd like to introduce Vi Wahi, Environmental Health and Justice Program Director for Alaska Community Action on Toxics. Vi is a bilingual Yupik Eskimo from Savunga. Although her family moved to Nome, she grew up in both communities, traveling between Nome and St. Lawrence Island throughout her childhood. Vi joined ACAT in 2002 to assist on the St. Lawrence Island Environmental Health and Justice Project, becoming project coordinator in 2004, and then environmental justice community coordinator a year later when her work expanded to include 15 Norton Sound villages. In 2009, she stepped into the position of environmental health and justice program director. Vi was awarded the Environmental Achievement Award in recognition of valuable contributions to environmental excellence in Alaska by the Alaska Native Tribal Health Consortium. Vi and her husband have four boys and live in Anchorage. Welcome, Vi. Would you like to begin? Yes, thank you, Diana. Uh, good morning. Thank you very much. My name is Vi Wari. My Yupik name is Bangun Hak. I'm the daughter of the late John and Della Wari from Savunga, Alaska. And um, I'd like to thank the communities uh, of Savungan Gamble and my uh, immediate family, my husband and four boys and, and others uh, that support us in this work that we do. Um, <clears throat> you heard about the results of our traditional food study that we have had with the communities of Savunga and Gamble at their request uh, once uh, the results of our um, community-based participatory research project that ACAT has had with the villages of Savunga and Gamble. Uh, clearly, when the community members found that the high levels of PCB, PCB levels in the blood of our, our people from the first National Institute of Environmental Health Sciences grant ACAT was awarded. So it's very important to uh, include the community uh, when we report back, which um, ACAT staff and research members, we have traveled back to both villages to report back to the community. We have done this numerous times, uh, three times, and, and we also discuss uh, the results that um, all the meetings that we, we have in the community um, the communities have established a trust with our people. Um, you know, we're very sensitive of the way of life and the importance of the traditions and cultures. So uh, this trust has been established since Annie trusted um, uh, Pam Miller, our executive director, in 1997. So we have this long history, and we involve the community from the beginning to make sure that we hear their concerns and work with them to find solutions to address the contaminants that we're finding in our environment, in our foods, and in our bodies. 
So uh, we first came out to result, uh, discuss the results back with the leadership and community. Uh, at their request, we also had roundtable discussion with agencies in uh, uh, 2010 with our uh, ACAT staff and research team members, Dr. Um, Carpenter, uh, Ron Scudato, and also with the leadership of communities of Savonga and Gamble. So um, we also, the, the round table was to, to talk about next actions the, the communities and agencies can take to what to do with this data because um, um, as you can see from the results, you know, um, the communities feel that uh, because of the importance of our traditional foods that uh, this data that provided information about uh, the fate of these chemicals that we're finding are in the Arctic are important for national and international decisions um, concerning, continued, con concerning their continued use and production. So they have been involved actively in statewide, national, and international level um, for chemical policy reform. We brought a delegation to Washington, D.C where we brought uh, members of uh, the leadership from both the tribal, city, and corporation council from both villages. We also had elder and youth representatives uh, at, because, um, because nobody was really coming to the help of our people um, to address their concerns and, and, uh, and how to um, take action. So we brought a delegation to D.C. where we had high-level uh, meetings with um, uh, high-level decision makers. Uh, also had um, uh, meetings with members of Congress. Also we worked toward uh, the outdated National Chemical Policy Reform Toxic Substances Control Act. Uh, which is to um, to phase out and and bring in safer alternatives for uh, use of toxic chemicals. Also, um, I've been fortunate enough to go to uh, Geneva, Switzerland, uh, two times for the Stockholm Convention, which is uh, indigenous. <coughs> excuse me, as part of the Indigenous Peoples Caucus. Uh, to ensure that the 172 countries that have ratified the Stockholm Convention are aware of these uh, persistent organic pollutants that we're finding in our traditional foods, uh, even though we don't have manufacturers and industries in our backyard, um, we um, wanted to make sure that uh, they knew of the effects that it's having on our people up here in the Arctic where we're some of the mostly highly uh, exposed people on the planet. So um, we have also worked on the human rights um, level uh, in 2005 with the assistance of International Indian Treaty Council. ACAT on behalf of St. Lawrence Island filed a human rights to food and subsistence. Um, with the Special Rapporteur at the UN level. Um, <clears throat> so, um, and also, you know, the, our communities have a right to know. I want to uh, stress that. Um, you know, we have a right to know about what's affecting our environment, uh, the health and well-being of our traditional foods. Uh, we have a connection spiritually, traditionally cultural, to these wild foods and to our environment, the two cannot be separated. And uh, the results have not um, affected the communities. Um, they chose not to change their diet. It's, it's you know, if uh, we change our diet, it, you know, 
is connected to our way of life. We cannot separate the two. It's our identity, our culture, it's a way of life that we have had for, for many generations. So we uh, have chosen to take this information, to take active measures to um, change laws. It has empowered our communities to do that. Also recently, at the Alaska Federation of Natives, the Native Village of Savonga proposed a um, resolution to the Board of Alaska Federation of Natives to uh, support um, um, safer chemical healthy families, the national um, TOSCA reform. So it was passed by the board. Uh, so that's another victory that we've had. Um, and also uh, we uh, are hoping to encourage that Senator Murkowski and Senator Begich support our cause for um, the Safer Chemicals Healthy Families uh, chemical reform. Uh, it's important that uh, we also educate our Congress and, uh, and legislators about the importance uh, of national and international uh, laws to protect the health and well-being of our, uh, our Arctic indigenous people and also our people on St. Lawrence Island. Um, so, with that, um, I'd like to uh, thank Alaska Community Action on Toxics for uh, giving me this opportunity to, to work with the organization. We're one of the few that is doing what we are in, um, statewide and nationwide to empower communities like ours on St. Lawrence Island to, um, to do this research uh, with the leadership uh, because as you can see with the results of our traditional food study, um, this has, uh, in, in, as I mentioned, empower our communities. And uh, we do have a right to know. Uh, and uh, we will continue to live off our land and ocean like we have for many generations. So um, it's very important to uh, be active in um, chemical policy reform at your local level, in, um, in your state, and also national and international level. So um, thank you for uh, giving me th this opportunity. Thank you, Vi. Thank you for sharing a community perspective on what this research means. Finally, I'd like to introduce Alaska Community Action on Toxics founder and executive director, Pam Miller. Pam has 30 years of experience in environmental health research and advocacy. She's known for her work as an advocate for statewide, national, and international chemicals policy reform to protect environmental and human health, with an emphasis in the Arctic and subarctic regions. Pam served as principal investigator of the community-based participatory research team that conducted the traditional food study, and she recently returned from the seventh meeting of the POPs Review Committee in um, Geneva, Switzerland. Pam, would you like to begin? Good morning, Diana, and good morning, everyone. Um, Vi and I are out on St. Lawrence Island right now on Gamble, so we send our greetings from St. Lawrence Island. Uh, just to give you a little bit of background about Alaska Community Action on Toxics' work on the Stockholm Convention, we participated in the negotiation and implementation of the Stockholm Convention, and I'll talk a little bit more about what that is on persistent organic pollutants since 1998. We participate with environmental health and justice organizations from the, around the world who have joined to form a network of non-governmental organizations called the International POPs Elimination Network, which is now a network of more than 400 groups from Africa, Asia, Europe, the Pacific Islands, Central and South, and North America. We bring concerns and scientific evidence about the effects of POPs, both on public health, and our particular emphasis is the effects of these chemicals on the Arctic, because many of them are subject to long-range transport and accumulation in the Arctic. And as Vi mentioned, we have um, hosted and facilitated delegations of indigenous peoples to the meetings of the nations deliberating the convention. 
The Stockholm Convention is particularly significant as a means to protect the health of the Arctic environment and people's health because it addresses persistent toxic chemicals that can migrate long distances on wind and ocean currents. These chemicals tend to accumulate in the fat-rich food webs of northern environments, as, as Dr. Carpenter mentioned. And Arctic indigenous peoples now are known to have among the highest levels of POPs contamination in blood and breast milk of any population on Earth, even though most of these chemicals have never been produced in the Arctic. We worked very hard to get language in the preamble of the convention that acknowledges that Arctic ecosystems and indigenous communities are particularly at risk because of the biomagnification of persistent organic pollutants and that contamination of traditional foods is a public health issue. And that's language directly from the preamble of, of the Stockholm Convention. Exposure to low levels of these chemicals can harm human health including interfering with learning and development, causing diseases of the immune system, reproductive disorders, and cancers. The convention is strongly based on the, the precautionary principle, which is something that our non-governmental organizations work very hard to achieve. And this really means that we want to be better safe than sorry. That is, we want to take action based on the weight of evidence, even though we don't fully understand the, the ramifications of and scientific evidence concerning a chemical, it's important to take action if we begin to suspect that a chemical might cause harm to human health. And we've also come to realize that research is very important and we do community-based research um, to help inform decisions. And we also recognize that, that research in itself is not enough, that we need global action to phase out chemicals that harm public health and the environment. The Stockholm Convention was adopted by governments from around the world in 2001. It entered into force in 2004 when 50 nations, the first 50 nations, ratified the treaty. The U.S. signed on to the treaty but has not yet ratified it. Currently, the convention includes 176 nations, which in the United Nations language are called parties, that agree to work together toward global elimination of the world's most dangerous chemicals. One of the strengths of the Stockholm Convention is that it's a living treaty, meaning that it includes provisions to add new chemicals that are toxic, that last a long time in the environment, and that can be transported long distances. And they have, for a chemical to be added to the convention, they have to meet certain scientific criteria for persistence, long-range transport, <coughs> ad <coughs> excuse me, adverse effects to human health, and wildlife, and also bioaccumulation in the food web. So there was an initial list of 12 chemicals that were included in the, in the convention initially that all the nations of the world agreed to, and these were the so-called dirty dozen chemicals that included certain pesticides such as aldrin, chlordane, DDT, and others, and also some industrial chemicals such as PCBs, dioxins, and furans. <coughs> In 2009, the parties of the nations of the convention agreed to add nine new substances and then an additional pesticide called endosulfan in 2011. The United States, as I mentioned, has not yet ratified this important treaty and does not participate constructively in its implementation. The scientific committee of the Stockholm Convention is called the POPS Review Committee and it works to determine whether chemicals that are nominated for inclusion under the convention meet the scientific criteria and warrant global action. So this most recent meeting of the POPS Review Committee, which again is the scientific committee of the Stockholm Convention, met in Geneva from October 10th to 14th, and they came together to make some important decisions about whether certain new chemicals should be added under the global legally binding provisions of the convention. This seventh annual meeting of the POPS Review Committee included consideration of four new candidate substances, work on alternatives to the pesticide endosulfan and also to DDT, and also uh, perfluorinated chemicals, which were added to the convention in 2009. And perfluorinated chemicals are now ubiquitous in the Arctic. These are chemicals that are used in stain-resistant applications, such as metalworking in pots and pans and in certain fabrics. 
They also addressed toxic interactions, looked at exemptions and alternatives to toxic flame retardants, and then considered a new report and the implications of uh, the impacts of climate change on, on POPs evaluation and the migration of POPs into the Arctic. So I mentioned that we have a, a network of non-governmental organizations from the lot around the world called the International POPs Elimination Network and a small but we think mighty team of these non-governmental organizations played an important role at this most recent meeting of the Scientific Review Committee, providing scientific evidence supporting inclusion of additional chemicals. And the group at the POPs Review Commit Committee included Eva Cremel, a scientist with the In Inlet Circumpolar Council, members of the International POPs Elimination Network, the National Toxics Network in Australia, and Pesticide Ac Action Network from Asia and the Pacific. And I'll just review quickly, um, the, the meeting was five days long, so there were a lot of things that happened and a lot of decisions that were made. But I think some of the most significant decisions that were made at the scientific meeting include um, a decision about a chemical known as hexabromocyclododecane, or HBCD. And this is one of the flame retardant chemicals. It's used very widely in building applications in polystyrene insulation. It's one of the most widely used flame retardants now, particularly in the developed world. And it's now found quite ubiquitously in Arctic wildlife and people, has effects on health, learning and development, and thyroid function at very low concentrations. And the POPs Review Committee made a decision to move it to the next stage and to recommend to the Conference of Parties that it be listed under, again, the global legally binding uh, provisions of the Convention for Global Action and Global Elimination. And there's more work yet to be done on this substance to look at some alternatives. The next substance that was considered at this particular meeting, a class of chemicals known as polychlorinated naphthalenes, and most of us have not even heard of these chemicals, yet they're very widely used in uh, uh, the production of abrasives, in polymers, in plastics, and in sy synthetic resins. And uh, again, these chemicals have effects on the immune system, on development and learning, and a likely uh, carcinogenic. These were viewed by the committee uh, to pass the scientific criteria for persistence, bioaccumulation, and long-range transport. Again, they're found in the Arctic. Uh, and so the committee agreed that these warrant global action and agreed to pass them to the next stage of the decision-making process. The next substance that was considered was hexachlorobutadiene, again, probably a chemical most of us have never heard of before. And this is a byproduct in the manufacture of chlorinated solvents. So many chlorinated solvents, industrial solvents, such as those used in dry cleaning and many industrial applications, when those solvents are produced, hexachlorobutadiene is a byproduct in that manufacturing process. Again, this, this chemical shares many of the harmful health effects that the other persistent pollutants do. Uh, and the committee, after careful review of this substance and looking at uh, whether it met the scientific criteria for persistence, bioaccumulation, long-range trans transport, and adverse health effects, agreed that, again, this chemical should also pass to the next phase of evaluation. One of the chemicals that we were in the last chemical that was considered at this meeting um, and one that our IPEN team was very interested in is a chemical known as pentachlorophenol. And this uh, chemical has been used for more than 50 years, very uh, widely around the world. It's primarily now used as a wood preservative, so in utility poles, in building applications. It's uh, used to soak the wood to prevent um, little creatures from, <laughs> from um, eating the wood, so it's a biocide that's been very, used very, very widely around the world. This is also a chemical <coughs> that is found around the world, including the Arctic. We know that it's found in blood and breast milk worldwide, including infant cord blood and breast milk of Inuit mothers. It's a carcinogenic chemical, that is, it causes cancer, um, particularly a, a form of blood cancer. It causes developmental harm and reproductive harm. This was a very controversial substance, and 
the Japanese government was quite concerned about listing this chemical under the convention and having it move forward for further evaluation. So a decision on this chemical was delayed for one year to gather more information. It's a chemical that's very complicated because it, it transforms into another chemical known as PCA, which is also very toxic and persistent and can go back and forth between pentachlorophenol and this PCA or pentachloral anisole. So considered together, those chemicals are very persistent. They transform back and forth to one another. But the Japanese delegate to the Scientific Review Committee wanted to take a year to gather more information. Um, we felt that there was quite enough information and um, we prepared an intervention with the Inuit Circumpolar Council, IPEN, Alaska Community Action on Toxics and Pesticide Action Network to urge the delegates to move forward with this chemical. And it will be considered at the next meeting of the POPS Review Committee. So I, I guess I'll, I'll close there. Um, but just to say there's a lot of important work that goes on at the Scientific Review Committee that meets each year to consider new substances that are nominated by the governments that are party to the convention. So again, this is a living treaty. Um, it just it deals with an initial 12 list of chemicals and work continues to try to find ways to um, promote alternatives to those chemicals. But then with the provisions to add new chemicals, uh, it, it, it's a real strength of this treaty. And I think it's a real important measure to protect the health of people living in the Arctic because as we know, these chemicals don't respect political boundaries. They migrate hundreds and thousands of miles on wind and ocean currents and end up in the food web of the Arctic. And really the only way to eliminate their use and to protect the health of present and future generations of people, as well as wildlife living in the Arctic, is to eliminate them globally under the legally binding provisions of the Stockholm Convention. So I think I'll stop there and, and again, thanks everybody for joining the call today and uh, really appreciate the opportunity to talk about the, the important work of the Stockholm Convention. Thanks so much, Pam, um, for your timely update on what's happening internationally. And I'd like to thank all of our presenters for taking the time to be with us today. We would now like to open the lines for questions and comments, so please wait a moment while we unmute the lines. <coughs> If you would like to ask a question or make a comment, please press star 6 on your telephone to unmute your line, and please state your name and affiliation. We also ask that you try to be brief with your comments to allow others the opportunity to speak as well. So, the, so just press star 6 if you'd like to ask a question. Don't be shy. Hello? <laughs> yes? Yeah, this is Eva Manila. I'm a guest um, at this teleconference. I would like to um, uh, commend the St. Lawrence Island people um, for requesting all these studies on behalf of them on behalf of their village and uh, in working on finding out what's wrong with our or what's happening with our sea mammals. I'm a long I'm a lifelong uh, subsistence user and um, I've always wondered uh, about our food that we eat and consume and um, it's I, I feel like I feel relieved <laughs> uh, to hear all this information about our sea mammals um, and know that we can still eat them and um, teach the teach our children how to use and preserve them. My, um, I've always wondered um, about certain things 
I've seen from our sea mammals in the past and um, just from this one teleconference uh, a lot of questions were answered and I think all the scientists and especially St. Lawrence Island for um, for their for their desire to help other people besides themselves you know answer questions and and uh, um, study our Arctic sea mammals and and how it affects ourselves. Thank you so much. That's all I have. Thank you, Eva. Um, would Can any of our presenters like to respond to Eva? This Eva? is this is Vi Wally. <coughs> Thank you, Eva, for your comments. And um, you know, our our traditional foods uh, are very nutrient dense. They contain uh, very important nutrients such as folic acid, vitamin C and D, iron and zinc, and they're high in um, protein, fat. As you heard. Dr. Carpenter uh, mentioned the omega-3 fatty acids, and they're also high in antioxidants and low in carbohydrates. Um, <clears throat> there is no alternative to our subsistence way of life, and, and as is, you can hear from Eva, you know, uh, it's, um, it's a way of life that uh, we will continue to live and we will share uh, the knowledge that has been passed on to our children um, and how to preserve our traditional foods. Um, so it's uh, one important aspect that communities have a right to know about uh, all the concerns that we're seeing in uh, illnesses uh, that we're seeing in our communities. We have um, much higher hospital rate, hospitalization rate for infection in our uh, Alaska Native infants, twice the risk of uh, birth defects as white infants. Uh, so it's important to take action to, um, to protect the health and well-being of our Alaska Native people and future generations. So it's important that we have these discussions. And um, however, I, you know, I would like to thank um, Eva also um, that um, since she said that the folks on St. Lawrence Island are willing to share this information and, and help educate others, that's what's most important, the community right to know. Thank you. Thank you. Would someone else like to ask a question of um, Dr. Carpenter, Vi, or Pam? Please just press star six on your telephone. Yeah, my name is Russ Maddox down here in Seward, and I, it's a two-part question, really. I mean, knowing from all these studies the prevalence of contaminants, these PCBs and pesticides in fatty tissues of animals out in the islands, are there any plans to expand to the east and, and check other Arctic villages and and their subsistence food sources to see if they're similar? I understand that the, the military dumps definitely cause a lot of impact at St. Lawrence Island, but is there any reason to believe the other Arctic villages wouldn't be subjected to the same levels? Uh, I think that that's a very good question, and the answer is that uh, it's very likely that the other Arctic villages are subjected to the same levels of contaminants. And obviously, uh, since the major source of the contamination is atmospheric transport, uh, this is going to be a problem with subsistence foods if it's uh, marine mammals or fish. Now, we did do one study on uh, PCB levels and pesticides in fish from Adak Island in the Aleutians and found very high levels of of uh, PCBs there. Uh, our study did not include uh, water, fish from waters that we would not expect to be so contaminated. Uh, and I previously had been involved in studies on uh, wild as compared to farmed salmon 
where we sampled salmon from uh, several different places in Alaska and found that the wild salmon were relatively uncontaminated, but the uh, farmed salmon from uh, both the Pacific and the Atlantic Oceans, because of the food they eat, have pretty high levels of, of these same contaminants. Yeah, we recently, um, maybe a couple years ago, took some uh, traditional food sta samples from whales. Uh, we wanted to compare uh, traditional foods from what we call mainland Alaska compared to the data that we have on St. Lawrence Island. So those samples are still being analyzed. And then perhaps also just to mention a new project that we're just beginning work on that was recently supported by the National Institute of Environmental Health Sciences. And again, this is a collaboration with the communities on St. Lawrence Island, uh, as well as the University of Alaska and David's University, University at Albany. And this will be to investigate the presence of endocrine disrupting chemicals in this region in water bodies, looking at fish called stickleback, looking at levels in traditional foods, as well as in household dust and in uh, human blood serum. We're very concerned about different exposure pathways of these chemicals. And, and uh, in this study, in addition to looking at <coughs> water bodies and traditional foods, we'll be looking at household exposures because some studies show that some of the higher exposures are actually caused um, by exposure, especially in children, to household dust and air that are contaminated with these chemicals because these chemicals are found in many products that we use in our homes, including furniture, foam, electronics, and other products, carpet backing, fabrics, and so on. And these chemicals slough off into the home environment and were exposed through household dust and air. So we'll be looking at that as well. I think we have time for one more question, if it's very brief. Question or comment? OK. Um, I don't hear anyone piping up. So I just want to thank everyone again very much for joining us today. And if you have additional questions or comments, please feel free to contact us at 907-222-7714. You can also email me at diana at akaction.org, and I'll make sure that your question or comment reaches the right presenter. Um, I'd also like to let everyone know about two upcoming Che Alaska teleconferences. On Wednesday, November 30th, we will have a call on health hazards of exposure to coal dust, and our guest presenter will be Dr. Michael Hendricks. And on Wednesday, December 14th, the call will be on the role of synthetic chemicals in diabetes and obesity, and our guests will be Dr. Bruce Blumberg and Dr. David Carpenter. So we hope that you can join us for one or both of those, and to get the dial-up instructions, you can also contact me. And thank you, everyone. Once again, have a wonderful day. The call will be rec is recorded and will be posted to our website within the next few days.